Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Traveling Together, Aligning Your Sales and Marketing to the Education Buyer's Journey. We appreciate your joining us today and before we start the program, I'd like to just go over a few housekeeping items. We will be taking questions throughout the presentation, so if one comes up for you, feel free to go ahead and send it along using the question tab on your control panel. Type your question into the top box and then click on the send button. I'll receive your question and make sure our panelists get it answered for you. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use that same question feature to get my attention and I'll do my best to resolve the problem for you. We will be providing you with a recording of the webinar as well as a copy of the PowerPoint slides. There's gonna be a lot of information covered today, so those will be great resources once we get off here. Just keep an eye on your inbox for a link to those later today or tomorrow. Now let's get started. I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers, Jacob Hansen and Craig Spooner with PR with Panache, and Jenny Schumacher with Agile Education Marketing. Jacob is the managing partner of PR with Panache and has spent most of his career dedicated to sales growth, marketing, and brand awareness. He brings a fierce passion for education and extensive experience in moving high quality companies and their brands to the forefront of the education marketplace. Jacob is a skilled communicator and has a talent for connecting the dots between sales, marketing, and public relations and creating dynamic communication plans to tell clients' stories. Jacob attended Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado, where he graduated cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Modern Language. Jacob has found his way back to his native Minnesota, where he enjoys exploring the world with his two young children. Craig is an inbound and integrated marketing storyteller with PR with Panache. Craig started his career in health sciences, but quickly realized his creative side was begging to express itself. So he left hospital life behind and moved into the world of marketing, where he has grown exceedingly skilled at building brands and creating outstanding content. As an expert communicator with a big picture mindset, he has the ability to transform basic ideas into full-fledged campaigns that are sure to effectively tell your story and deliver results. When Craig's not in the office, he's either camping in one of our na national parks or finding an excuse to be outdoors with his dogs, Gus and Leroy. Jenny has been working in the education data world for more than 15 years and is proud to have spent the last several years as part of the Agile Education Marketing family. She has held a variety of roles throughout her career, including sales, marketing, operations, and client services. She understands the education market and provides a unique organizational perspective to help clients exceed their marketing goals. Formerly a director of operations with Denver Public Schools, Jenny worked with the talented team there to launch its groundbreaking teacher performance and evaluation program. Jenny has an MBA with an organizational leadership emphasis, loves the team she works with at Agile, and dotes on her family, much to the chagrin of her two teenage sons, who also happen to be turning 15 today. So we are thrilled to have this talented group of education marketing experts with us, and I'm going to go ahead and hand the program over to Jacob to get us started. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the introductions, Emily, and welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that you joined us. Um, Real quick before we dive in, wanted to wish Jenny's two boys a very happy 15th birthday and be careful to all of those folks on the roads in Colorado. They will be on the road soon. So um, just a word to the wise there. Um, but uh, like Emily had mentioned, we're here to talk about aligning our sales and marketing efforts to um, our buyer's journey. Um, but uh, we wanted to start and, and kind of dial back a little bit here that if we don't have our sales and marketing aligned, um, we're going to have a tough time aligning that to our buyer's journey, um, to the market um, that we live in and all of those kinds of things. So I wanted to start off with something that um, may resonate with you, may resonate with you from a former organization you were with. But um, unfortunately, the world we live in today, sales and marketing folks are primarily at odds with each other. Um, a recent HubSpot survey found that more than 80% of sales and marketing folks describe themselves using neg or describe the other using negative terms. Um, that's a lot. That's more than one in five, or four in five, excuse me. Um, and so, you know, there's got to be something we can do about this. And, you know, just a couple of examples here that, you know, really are common things that, you know, sales says we didn't get enough leads, so we're not hitting our numbers. Um, if we got more leads, then we'd be able to do it. Um, and marketing, of course, looks at it as, you know, they get all the credit. They're the ones that get the commissions. Their job is easy. We hand them leads and um, they still can't close them. Um, if any of these things are, are familiar to you, we're going to dive into a few places that potentially we can address these and help bring these two teams together. Um, Suzanne, if you could go to the next slide, that would be fantastic. And so I wanted to start with marketing. Of course, I'm, I'm, a, I'm really a marketing and PR guy at heart. Um, I have worn a sales hat many times, um, and I've seen this issue from both sides. 
Um, and so one of the primary issues that, that I've seen in organizations I've been a part of in companies that we come into contact with is that marketing is really viewed as a support position or a support team um, to sales rather than a business driver. Um, and really what I mean is, is, you know, if you look at your sales funnel, um, marketing should own that top part of the funnel, whether, you, you know, depending on how you have that funnel laid out, they need to own that zero to 20 percent, zero to 30 percent, wherever you, you call a lead qualified. Um, and if they're not given the opportunity to drive business and drive those leads, um, they very much are going to fall into that support position. Um, you know, some of uh, some of the things that we see happening um, and these are conversations with friends, with with companies we come into contact with. Um, is, you know, marketers are left to be at sales back and call. Um, I need a one sheeter for a campaign into North Carolina. I need a, a leave behind for this meeting that I've got tomorrow. Um, while those things are extremely important, it puts marketing in a position where they're not in the driver's seat as far as being able to accomplish what they're there for. And that is to create that lead pipeline um, to get those leads qualified and handed over to sales. Um, the other piece here is that, you know, it, a lot of times, um, and we're going to touch on communication in a little bit, um, but sales doesn't fully understand what marketing is doing. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's uh, they don't even know that campaigns are running. Um, they don't know what's going on. They don't know how to connect the dots um, between social and, and some of the other things that are happening, email campaigns, um, conferences, whatever it may be. Um, and so sales feels as if, you know, they're the ones shouldering the primary burden and that marketing should be at their beck and call um, because they're the ones bringing the money into the company. If we can change that viewpoint um, and help sales understand that without marketing, those leads wouldn't be coming in um, and, and help to put marketing in that driver's seat as far as a the, the primary driver behind lead generation and lead qualification um, is really going to make a huge difference. And again, we will be diving into some things that we can do to address these issues um, a little bit further on. Um, but Suzanne, let's take a look at some of the issues with, with how sales is viewed on the next slide. Um, so these are, again, some things that we hear um, that I heard as a sales rep from our marketing team um, and that we kind of tackle every day in the work we do with our clients um, that really sales... Um, they're only interested in the sale. They're only interested in closing the deal, not really interested in how the sausage is made. Um, I read an article, I think it was published in Inc. or maybe Forbes the other day that uh, um, was written by a prominent marketer. And he had a comment in there that he asked a sales rep, um, where, do, where are your leads coming from? And the sales rep answer was, well, they come from this platform called Marketo. Um, I'm just going to let that sink in for a second. Um, because that, that sales rep truly believed that their leads were coming from Marketo. They didn't, they weren't making the connection that no, it's the marketers that are driving that. It's the marketing team that is putting those drip campaigns in place, that is sharing content on social, um, that is hosting the webinars, whatever it may be. Um, sales is looking at that point that we're getting the lead rather than looking back at, you know, how did that lead, how was it generated? What source did it come from? How is it nurtured along to where it is today? Um, rather than so solely looking just at um, closing a deal with a lead that they do have. Um, and of course, you know, a few other things, they get all the credits and their, their job is easy. And, and being from a marketer standpoint, you know, seeing some of the quality leads that we help clients push through their funnel and hand over to sales, sometimes it's easy to fall into that trap and say, you know, we have done everything. We've checked every box for them. This lead is not only marketing qualified, but it is super duper marketing qualified. Um, there is no way that they should be able to, or they shouldn't be able to close this deal um, with a couple of quick conversations. Um, and so those are some of the things that uh, that we see um, where sales and marketing is at odds. Um, Suzanne, if we could go to the next slide, uh, would love to kind of talk about um, the, the, the uniting factor between sales and marketing. Um, and this is, you know, it seems like a no brainer, but it not, isn't always um, the case uh, that revenue money is the uniting factor between sales and marketing. If marketing isn't performing their jobs and delivering leads to sales, revenue is going to suffer vice versa. If sales aren't able to close the leads or they're not getting quality leads, um, revenue is going to suffer. And so there's a lot of different ways to get sales and marketing on the same page. Um, and I, I, we're going to dive into each one of these bullet points as we go through our conversation. Um, however, communication and team building are two of the most important factors that helping both teams understand we're in this together. We have one revenue goal for this quarter. It's up to our teams to figure out how to get there. It's not up to sales to figure out what they're going to do and marketing to figure out what they're going to do. Um, it's very much a sales needs to pick up where marketing is left off. Um, marketing needs to know what's working and what isn't. Sales needs to know 
all of the information that they can as far as how a lead arrived in their inbox or in their CRM um, so that their answer isn't, you know, it came from Marketo or it came from Pardot. Um, and so I can't stress enough, you know, how, how important those are. And really it's even, um, again, from that same article I mentioned earlier, um, that, that same, uh, author had written about, um, you know, a weekly check-in with the sales leadership and marketing leadership isn't really enough. Um, sales reps are busy. They're the ones that are you know, pounding the pavement. They need to see that marketing is invested in their success because their success is our success as well. Um, and so looking at things like, you know, team building, whether it's a lunch and learn, it's a brainstorming session, or it's simply getting out of your office and walking around and talking to the reps and saying, you know, how did your calls go yesterday? Um, how, you know, what, what happened with these leads? Anything specific you have to share with me from folks that we fed you from this particular campaign? And we want to hear the good, the great, the bad, and the ugly. Um, there's no way we can improve or continue to build on what's working if we don't know what those are. Um, and so before I dive in too deep into some of these things, I'd love to uh, um, to go to the um, the next slide. But um, uh, but before we do, I think before we dive into this, Emily, I wanted to open this up for questions um, as well as comments from the other panelists. I kind of dominated these last few slides. <laughs> we do have a couple questions that came in, um, so we can take those. Or if um, Craig and Jenny have something they want to interject before we do that, that's fine too. You know, I do think from a sales and marketing perspective, when you talk about that that kind of push and pull at all times, one of the things we get wrapped up in here at Agile is just the pace at which we're running at all times. And I think, you know, sometimes it's easier said than done. We all know we need to communicate more effectively and make sure everyone's in the loop as to what we're doing from a marketing perspective. Um, but it really gets difficult just in the day to day. And I, we're all in the middle of the back to school thrust right now. And I, everyone's running with their heads cut off. So, you know, I do think that what people will see though, after you do take a little bit of time and start this communication channel is all of a sudden things become a little bit easier. Maybe you know what to do with, with the leads more quickly. Maybe you understand more effectively, which are the leads that bubble up to the top of your funnel. Because I know just from our perspective here, trying to make the time to talk about, okay, this is what the campaigns are this week that we're focused in on. These are the shows that we're attending. This is what we're doing. How should we as a sales rep actually, you know, handle those incoming leads? That's a difficult thing to do. So when we do it, we absolutely see the return on that investment of time. So I think it's a fundamental challenge, you know, within all of our businesses, especially this time of year, to make that time and that, that energy just happen. I couldn't agree with that more, Jenny. Well said. All right, let's just take um, at least one question here before we move along. Um, so I think you're probably going to touch on this as we go along, but it, it also deals with the communi communication issue. Um, and it's that our sales team wants to get access to all of the leads that come in immediately, whether it's from AdWords, from a webinar, from an email campaign. How do we explain to them that they're going to be more successful if they don't immediately call and say, hey, do you want a demo? If we, you know, explaining basically the value of nurturing. That is... I would <laughs> you go I, ahead, I deal with this. I have to tell you, I deal with this every day. Um, more than anything, our team wants qualified leads. And as we as we have gone through the process of implementing a marketing automation system over the last several years and really de delving into lead nurturing campaigns, everyone wants those leads as soon as they're warmed up. We've really had to determine what does warm up mean. And the only way we've been able to really effectively do that at Agile is frankly by some testing. It's working with the sales reps to say, you know, how about you give these people the call when their score hits a certain threshold? Or how about after these types of actions you try reaching out and let's see. We've really done a lot of trial and error on our side to help determine where is that special, you know, what's the right interaction? What is the right number to actually hit? before our leads really start popping into substantive conversations. So I love this question because it is definitely the bane of our existence is, okay, where do we actually um, draw that line? We work with clients every day that are in various stages of implementing marketing automation systems and have absolutely the same kind of crux of an issue. 
those clients that have really established a strong lead nurturing program have done so over time. I really wish that there was some kind of playbook that we could all look at to say that, okay, within your type of company and this type of lead, this is when you should engage. But frankly, it comes with a little bit of experience, a lot of patience and, a, and some time. When Jenny, I, I would echo everything you said, and I, I know that we're, uh, we want to keep moving things forward, but I'll, uh, we are going to address some of these things in more detail, especially some of the things that Jenny just mentioned. But um, talking about this from a, a sales perspective, um, kind of putting you know my, my hat on when I used to be a, a rep, um, is you know weather marketing told me what you just said, Jenny, have some patience. We want to get you quality over quantity. My mentality was, you know, I'm really good at my job. Just give me the leads and I will close them. Um, and, uh, you know, with many things, you know, I, I truly believe that I was right. And for a lot of things I, I did, I closed a lot of sales, but, um, what we did was actually pull data. Um, and we looked at when, when we were in contact with folks who were deemed quote unquote qualified or a marketing qualified lead and those who weren't and looked at close ratios or the length of time it took from first sales contact to close. Um, and the data didn't lie. I mean, there was no arguing with that data that while I was still successful in both it took me two three four times as long to close the deal you know twice as many three times as many touch points with them um as it did with a a a qualified lead or a more qualified lead um and so that's one well is you know your sales team may roll their eyes at your marketing folks when they say what jenny just mentioned take a look at your last six months of closed deals and see you know some of those what what were the qualifications that when they were handed over and if you can pinpoint data that Sales rep A, you know, you you took two touch points and closed this deal for X amount, and it took two weeks. Um, but in this case, it took six touch points, um, two de- two extra demos, bringing their the rest of their team into the fold, and you closed it. You know, four months later, um, in all of those touch points, they could be talking to dozens of other qualified leads that are ready for them to engage. So um, I know that we need to transition, so I'll kind of leave it there because we will build on this again. But fantastic question. Great. Well, let's move along. All right, sounds good. So this next slide is actually something that, you know, many of us have probably seen over the course of our time within education. So the standard K-12 purchasing cycle, right? So people are making plans during certain months. They're kind of gaining awareness and understanding products. Then they're considering them, running them through trials, getting some more information about what it would take to implement that product, and then purchasing over the summer. I think this is pretty standard. We all see this. Some of us, some of us may feel this. One of the things, though, that this does is this doesn't necessarily talk about your company. And your company may have a very different buying cycle when you put that on top of there. You know, your, your buyer's experience, your buyer's journey may happen over the course of 18 to 24 months. So as marketers, you understand a certain component of this. And then as sales, you understand a component of this as well. This is where communication comes in and really makes that play and makes your marketing more effective for your sales to be more effective. So if marketing understands a component of this and sales understands a component of this, that becomes immediately critical that your team talks about, okay, what do we both know and how are we going to accommodate that? So if you know that you have, say, this 12-month, this beautiful purchasing cycle here that's a 12-month cycle, and you know that your buyer is planning for what they want to do in the months of May and July, months of May through July, how are you going to be communicating with folks from both a sales and marketing perspective through that point of their buying cycle? In August through December, they're actually starting to get hands-on. They're starting to listen to webinars and learning specific things about your product. You want your sales and marketing teams to be talking that same language at that time. So it becomes even more important when you think about some of, like this purchasing cycle is a business critical cycle. Any of your processes that you're running through with sales and marketing, that communication can be critical just so you're on the same page in terms of what you're saying, What is your tone? What are your expectations for things that are going on during that time? So this is an example, I think, of that type of conversation that could be had between your teams to help build that awareness and, frankly, build that trust between the two teams that you're on the same page, you're talking the same talk, and you're transferring those leads from marketing that are generated 
to your sales folks and both sides know that the job is being done at the right time. So at this point, definitely I want to open it up to other panelists to talk throughout this. Um, does anyone else have any comments? Jenny, I do. This is this is Jacob, um, and I'm Craig. I'm going to pass this to you in here in just a second. But um, you know, everything that you're saying, Jenny, is is absolutely true. You know, we we do kind of live and die by this this purchasing cycle. Um, but just Jenny, as as you had mentioned about sales and marketing, understanding different pieces of this. Um, you know, we, we also have another piece that we need to lay over this purchasing cycle, and that that is your buyer's journey. And that's that's something that we're going to get to here in just a second. Um, but ultimately, you know, we well, we can't really short circuit this this purchasing cycle. You know, you can't come in at the end of the summer um, and expect folks um, to just say, yep, I want to buy from you um, when they've gone through all of these other phases. Just like we can't short circuit, you know, in the vast majority of cases, the buyer's journey. Um, you know, we can't come in with a, you know, buy this before school starts and we'll give you a 50% discount. Um, that 50% discount might not mean anything to them because they don't even realize they have a problem. Or maybe they do realize they have a problem, but they're in the middle of a, a three-year contract with another vendor that they're unhappy with. And they need to evaluate um, through the next cycle to purchase. So, um, Suzanne, if you could go to the next slide. Um, this is uh, this slide is going to kind of recall back to some of the things we just talked about, but also set the stage for um, our buyer's journey and our buyer's context. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about communication, we talk about getting marketing and sales on the same page. Um, while this may seem a little bit um, official or maybe a little bit um, over the top, Creating a service level agreement between sales and marketing is incredibly powerful. Um, what it'll do is, is it essentially um, helps both sides understand each other's roles. It provides an opportunity for them to collaborate and create a plan so that they all understand what the other is doing, where each fits into the puzzle, um, and they're each able to hold themselves and the other team accountable for what's happening. Um, the other huge thing that, that we've mentioned as well is that this service level agreement should define exactly what a marketing qualified lead is um, and what happens once that lead is qualified. And so, Jenny, kind of um, back to your comments around when does that handoff happen, this service level agreement can serve as that. And now, once you create this, it's not etched in stone. There needs to be some fluidity to this. Um, we as marketers can get pretty dang close to what a marketing qualified lead looks like. But without getting, um, you know, open feedback from the sales on leads that really were qualified and hearing why, what did that, what did that conversation entail? What happened there? Um, what, what things were they able to recall that they had seen from your company, blogs or um, tweets or, you know, Facebook posts, content on your website, um, participation in a webinar, whatever that might be. Um, it allows marketers to understand what's working. Um, but on the flip side, if a lead is passed off and, and the sales rep says, you know what, they're they're qualified, but not for a year. Um, they're in the middle of that three year contract. And right now they're just kind of seeing what's out there. We want to pass that back and throw it into a nurture campaign or a drip campaign so that we stay on their radar and we can requalify them and pass them back to that rep when they're ready. Um, but ultimately, this this SLA also creates a culture of feedback, um, but it does lower kind of that that blame game. Um, uh, that, you know, sales can't come back and say, well, they didn't create enough enough qualified leads um, or the marketing can't say, well, sales isn't closing our deals. Um, when you've got those numbers in there and saying, you know, this is the type of pipeline we need to have as far as qualified leads goes and, and close sales, you can go right to the service level agreement and see what was committed by each team. Did we hit those marks or not? Um, if we did, great. Where did it work the best? If we didn't, let's revisit our strategy, alter what a qualified lead may look like. Um, and, and build so that we get more results. Um, and so before I we transition to the next slide, Craig, is there anything you wanted to add on the, the SLA? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, one of the most difficult, com difficult components of any sales and marketing relationship is maintaining that ongoing momentum. So it's really important to identify some champions within the sales and marketing team to continue the conversation and, and to keep those open lines of communication. Um, more importantly, you know, meetings are, used to plan out agendas for content and everything else that you're moving through and making sure that you're covering your performance. Um, really, it's, I think, Jacob, you already highlighted this, but I'm just going to go over it one more time. You know, 
every team is working towards the same revenue goal, but um, the metrics that you use can change based on the, ca the campaigns and the content that you're creating. So having that ongoing discussion and agreement on, you know, what exactly makes a qualified lead and what analytics are important to your content strategy and overall sales strategy um, is extremely important moving forward to keep um, a successful campaign and a successful relationship uh, between sales and marketing. Awesome. Jenny, anything you want to add before we, we jump to the buyer's journey? No, I think we're ready to go. Awesome. Suzanne, if you go to the next slide, that would be wonderful. Um, and so uh, we've mentioned the buyer's journey a few times, um, and I'm sure most of you have been able to assume what that looks like. Um, but uh, essentially, um, HubSpot's definition of a buyer's journey is the framework that acknowledges a buyer's pathway or progression through um, a research and decision process that ultimately leads to a purchase. And so ultimately, you know, that buyer's journey starts or in today today's world usually starts well before you ever know that they're they're on their buyer's journey. They're turning to Google, they're turning to um, their friends, to social media to try and figure out, you know, do I have a problem? Um, do I do I actually need a solution? Um, is there a solution out there that I can use? Um, and so, you know, looking at our buyer's journey, the awareness, consideration and decision stage, that awareness stage is really that very high top of the funnel, again, where people may not know that they have a problem or have a challenge that needs to be solved, or they're maybe not fully understanding or able to put their finger on what exactly that problem is. Um, and if they're not fully able to put their finger on it, you know, they're, they're looking for ways to define that, um, looking for others that have that same issue. Um, and if we're um, uh, creating content and, and using channels like social or webinars or whatever it is, um, search engine optimization to attract those folks to the content we're creating to help them. Um, we ultimately get to pull them into our, our, our funnel. Um, consideration stage really is more that I know I have a problem. I know there's solutions out there. I'm going to evaluate what's going on, whether it's a product, it's a DIY solution, um, whatever it may be. And then of course, going to the decision stage where they're, they're looking to make a purchase or engage with a partner. Um, but what does this mean for us? Um, and and uh, really looking at mapping this out, this is another way. I'm um, going back to the the attendee that, that had asked the question about um, sales wanting more and more leads or access to them right away. Um, this buyer's journey should be part of your service level agreement. Um, it's something that you may have three, four, five, ten different buyers, depending on your product or the, the, the niches you live in. Um, but th those, those should be mapped out based on previous journeys that you've seen um, as much as you can document it. And there needs to be feedback from both sales and marketing on this buyer's journey. So that again, there's a mutual understanding between the two teams of how a buyer goes from being a stranger, someone who maybe lands on your website or signs up for a webinar to someone who is, is ready to, to sign a purchase agreement. Um, having those steps in place, um, not only allows both teams to understand what that lead is going through as they get to being marketing, marketing qualified to, you know, handing off to sales and all of those things. Um, but it's also a, a, a pathway that you, you want to guide your buyers or guide your prospects through. Um, and so, um, Suzanne, if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, you know, and today, again, we don't have any of the power being sellers. Um, they have every single um, piece of information they could ever want at their fingertips with their uh, with their their smartphones. Um, and so instead of asking us what what can I do to make them do make that buyer that prospect do what I want them to do, it's asking a different question. It's asking what what does that buyer need? Um, what does that prospect need from us in order to move to the next stage? Um, what is it? What what can we do to to provide that you know and, and satisfy their needs to get them to the next level of our funnel? Um, so that's one aspect that's really important to, um, the buyer's journey. Um, but others of course are, you know, again, focusing on that unifying goal of revenue, um, as well as, um, being able to develop a lead scoring strategy, which, um, again, can be, can and should be part of your service level agreement. Um, I know that we're going to be diving deeper into lead scoring here in just a minute, but before I do, I wanted to stop and see Jenny and Craig, do you guys have anything you wanted to chime in on? on these pieces? I would love to jump in here real quick. Uh, just a quick note, I don't think um, it's enough anymore for marketers or sales to be taking information from contact fields um, or, or, or getting information from their um, prospects via contact. Um, you need to understand exactly what pages they're visiting on your site, what content they're downloading so that the next stage 
um, of your outreach is actually dedicated to that person and built specifically for their needs. Um, that's really why the buyer's, buyer's journey is so important is because you're understanding exactly why they're coming to you, what challenges, what goals they have, and, and exactly how your solutions or products can fit in to their issues, you know, their goals, their challenges. Uh, Jenny, would you like to add anything there? You know, I do think we're starting to get into um, a conversation, too, about system requirements and, you know, what kind of platforms are available to help um, to help companies just understand these types of things. And like I mentioned earlier, many of us are in various stages of implementing marketing automation systems to various degrees. And I think at the base level, you know, setting up marketing um, automation to handle email campaigns and whatnot, that's an important thing. You want to make sure you're communicating outbound to clients. But like you said, Craig, understanding what are they actually doing on your website? At what point, how many hours or minutes or seconds of research do they need to be doing before they're going to open up and actually reach out to you for additional information? Those types of um, just kind of different touch points with that, with that prospect to help understand, okay, if we see that they're getting stuck here or we see that they need this type of information before they're, they're contacting us, putting that, that effort into resourcing, how are we going to provide more information at a, maybe a different stage to help accelerate that journey? Those are the types of things that you get when you start looking at kind of enhanced analytics around what people are actually doing within your, within your system. When, um, Jenny, I'm glad you brought that up that uh, I know we'll advance to the lead scoring and get more in depth there. Um, but I would agree with everything you said. And, you know, not everyone, um, it's not in the cards for everyone to have a marketing automation platform. I mean, there's great ones out there. You look at like HubSpot or Pardot or Marketo, Acton, Eloqua. I mean, the, the list goes on. All of them have their strengths. But, um, you know, th there are kind of those diet versions out there that um, oftentimes will suffice depending on your goals um, or even cobbling together free tools. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to look at that, but some of the other pieces that, whether it's a marketing automation platform or you are connecting um, different systems, looking at social interaction, looking at, you know, attendance of events, whether they're in person at a conference um, or something you're hosting with a, a district partner, um, you know, it's, it's engaging with a product demo or watching a video on your website. There's so many different pieces to be thinking about. Um, in tracking that engagement that, um, you know, we internally, we talk a lot about and with our clients about folks that are downloading content, that that is always a good sign that they are progressing. Um, whether it's a very top of the funnel infographic or it's, a, you know, it's a, um, an ebook or a guide or a checklist or something like that, um, there are folks out there that can very easily become a marketing qualified lead without downloading a single thing on your website. Um, just through page views, email interaction, attendance of events, uh, social interaction, social sharing. It really depends on, you know, some of those external interactions as well. Um, and so again, having tools in place to be able to connect those so that you're able to see that John Doe superintendent at, at District X, um, he's never downloaded a thing, but he's looked at every single page we have that addresses um, reading on grade level. And he's engaged with a couple of our tweets or he's tweeting about that. Um, whatever those things are, those are things that to take into account that, you know, maybe aren't happening specifically on the pages of your website. But um, Craig, I know you're going to dive much deeper into this in, in the lead scoring um, conversation. So Suzanne, if you could move to the next slide, that would be awesome. And I'll, I'll turn the mic over to Craig. So lead scoring is a huge conversation nowadays um, in any industry, really. But in, in education, it's very interesting. Um, just understanding where a lead is in their journey to purchase. And you can figure that out a lot, a lot of different ways. Um, for us, I think one of the larger conversations is, you know, and even going back to this previous discussion about the buyer's journey, um, understanding where the pitfalls in your content are, where we're missing that connection from one stage to the next. Um, and the way that we think about this and the way that we've addressed this in the past is just thinking about the way people move through your website. Um, you know, is it from organic search they find you through searching for some sort of solution or challenge that they're currently facing? And then moving to a blog post that you've written about that. And then figuring out, okay, there's a checklist or an infographic on this page that covers exactly what I'm experiencing right now. So the steps to actually go through determining how you add a score to a certain piece of content on your site is, you know, very important, not only to the user experience and leading them down the right content paths within your website to be the most helpful and informative service provider that you can be, 
but um, <clears throat> excuse me, helping them find that next stage of content uh, not only helps you in your process of figuring out how exactly is your website progressing forward and delivering marketing qualified leads and sale qualified lead to your sales team, um, but also figuring out, you know, what type of content is working on my site? What isn't? Um, what might we need to change in our strategy currently that isn't really delivering? Um, and it also can tell you exactly what's delivering the most bang for your buck. So is it a couple different playbooks or something that you have on your site or is it an ebook that someone's downloading constantly? Um, you know, a lot of these things kind of play in. But, um, you know, I think it's very important when we talk about aligning marketing and sales, um, figuring out exactly what that number is in your lead scoring strategy that says, okay, this person's ready for an outreach campaign. This person's ready to receive a schedule a demo email. Um, and this person might not be ready, but we'll keep them on a list. Um, so another important thing that ties in here is figuring out how you're bucketing the people behind everything in your site. So creating lists of people who download certain assets and figuring out how those pieces of content might be able to be brought together um, or at least grouped so that you know what the next stage in that content funnel would be. You know, if they downloaded a checklist related to personalized literacy and then you move on to an ebook related to the pitfalls or the challenges facing any teacher trying to personalize a strategy for a student, um, what might be that next stage of content that would lead to them actually trusting you and building trust with that prospect? Um, open up the floor here to, to either of these panelists to, to weigh in there. When Craig, I'd love to chime in quick, and Jenny, I'm sure you have, have a lot to say here too, um, that you, you hit on a lot of important things, and, and I'm going to make the assumption that there's a number of folks in the crowd here that do not have a lead scoring strategy in place. Um, and really can't stress the importance of this. And this, again, is something we mentioned in the service level agreement conversation earlier, um, that really, uh, if you don't have one in there, your best, uh, or if you don't have one created, um, the, your best source of information are going to be your existing customers. Take a look at sales that have closed in the last six, nine, 12 months, and look at what, what did it take for them to get there? How many touches? What was talked about? You know, what kind of information have you captured about them? Um, do you know where that source came from? Did they see an ad? Did they, you know, click on a, a PPC campaign that you have running? Whatever that source may be, a conference. Um, but looking at how that progresses and then us marketing folks that are creating the lead scoring strategy, talking to sales and saying, you know, does this make sense? What, what do you need this person to know and be ready to talk about? when they arrive in your your inbox when they arrive as a qualified lead um and i can't stress enough um two things that you mentioned craig number one is um creating content for different levels of the funnel um some folks may come to you and they're ready for a demo they've done their research they know they have a problem they haven't engaged with anything else and they just say no i need to get online and and see how this product works um and that's great, uh, but there are the vast majority of folks aren't going to go that route. They need to see something else. So whether it's you know, and uh, using your example here on on literacy, Craig, it's an it, it's an infographic that shows you know the the benefits for student engagement by taking a personalized approach versus a traditional approach. Um, and they need to kind of see that to validate what they're thinking, or to validate that that you know maybe this is a solution to my student engagement challenge. Um, and, and progressing them through that way so that we're not jumping from a, an infographic like that to sending them, um, you know, sign up for a demo or here's your free trial. Um, but uh, understanding, you know, what that lead scoring pathway looks like and really aligning that to your buyer's journey is, is incredibly important. So, um, Jenny, I'll turn it over to you if you have comments as well. Sure. Just one quick comment is, again, this goes back to the, the critical nature of the communication between your sales and marketing folks. So as you're going through and developing a lead scoring program and developing the content to take people down different paths and get them to through their journey, um, that conversation between sales and marketing just cannot be stressed enough. So um, as you're looking through metrics, follow that up with conversations to find out, okay, what's the real story behind these metrics? We see that we had a three-month close on this. That was better than our typical four-month close. What was our entire process, what was the buyer's entire journey, which includes those things that you can't track, like a conversation with sales reps and what exactly did they talk about. So um, I do think that those things are all really valid um, in generating lead scores and then kind of reevaluating your, your lead scores as you go through this process. When, um, thank you, Jenny. And, and Suzanne, if you could go to the next slide, a lot of the things that Jenny just mentioned is covered in that, that next slide. but um 
you know, I, I couldn't agree with you mentioned more what you, what you said there, Jenny, anymore. But one, one other thing to add as well in um, um, that whole process is, um, you know, we, we need to, again, stress the fact that we have feedback on leads. You know, what did work, what didn't. Um, sales also needs to understand what marketing is doing. They need to know that we're not just screwing around on social media. They need to know what we're doing to qualify these leads so that they, again, understand when those folks arrive. But one point to add to what you just mentioned, Jenny, is you know there, there are other factors that maybe we can't ever track or we can't learn that are incredibly important to our lead scoring strategy. And it's, again, looking at those recently closed sales and figuring out what was their problem. What, why did they buy? And, and of course, it's, you know, a good portion of it is you've got a solution that they need, but why did they need it? Um, using Craig's literacy example is if they have a huge influx of English language learners, they need to accommodate those students. I guarantee that there are dozens, if not hundreds of other districts out there that have the exact same issue. And so you, again, can, can score your leads based on role, based on interaction, based on, but also based on need. If you have a solution that fits the bill for supporting um, you know, new immigrant families or ELL students, ELL parents, um, target those districts based on what you saw there. Because again, you're, you're looking for that path of least resistance. So you may score something higher, if they indicate that they do have a high influx of ELL students, um, that's something that you know you've got a solution that is working. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I threw that in there as well. Um, but I know we're running a little short on time, so wanted to pass the mic back over um, to you, Jenny and Craig, uh, to go through some of the tactics that we've mentioned as well in, in helping to reach these folks. Sure. So as you see with this graphic, this is just an indication of all those things we deal with as marketers. So, so many different channels, so many different ways of putting your message out in front of people in different ways. And, you know, we think, as Jacob just said, social media is an important marketing channel. It's not just the, the cute stuff that a lot of people think we post um, just for fun. So, you know, making sure that your marketing message through social media is actually in line with your other with your other channels, but also well known to your sales reps. So they know what's being posted on social media. They know what's going out via email or direct mail. So they can then direct their conversations around those things as well. Um, once again, just going to quick communication points between the two teams to make sure your messages are completely aligned. Um, we're going to dig in a little bit deeper in each one of these channels just to talk a little bit about the buyer's journey, how each of these channels can support uniquely and some overlap through that journey, um, but then really how, um, really how that kind of drives what the context for the buyer is going to be. So how are you defining what context will be for that buyer? So we're going to move into the next slide to talk a little bit about buyer's context. And I think, Craig, this is one you're going to take over from this point, and then we'll talk a little bit more about each one of those tactics. Sure, and Jacob, you can help me tackle this as well. But um, from oh, – sorry, popped out there. Um, did we lose the slide here? Looks like we're getting it back. There we go. What's there we the go. webinar without a few technical difficulties? Exactly. <laughs> so um, the buyer's context, you know, why is this so important? Um, understanding the experience of the lead as they move to your website, exactly what they're going through and where they're getting their news, what's so important to them, their challenges, their solutions, and how you can help. Um, and then the importance of personalizing that buyer's experience. So, you know, buyers have all the power in the relationship these days. No longer, you know, far gone are the days where we're doing spray and pray email to everybody to, to make sure we can tell them about the best new product updates. You know, um, buyers have all the power because they've been given it, given it to them by the internet. Um, they have the power to search whatever they want and find the solutions and pricing that best fits their needs. Um, Again, so figuring out what that content strategy is and that outreach strategy is that fits your buyer's needs. So whether or not you're going to be more solution oriented, um, figuring out how your challenges or how the challenges they're facing fit into the solutions that you can provide and providing content that really suits their needs. Um, Jake, do you want to add anything here? <laughs> yes, and excuse me there. Um, you know, I want to hit on that, that personalization that um, 
you know, it's, it's really important to, to, again, be understanding the buyer's journey so you can help better understand your buyer's context. And the buyer's context is really where um, folks who are in your buyer's journey differ. Um, and understanding that is really important to being able to tailor your efforts to where they're at. Um, going back to the example we had earlier of, you know, what, what our sales cycle looks like in the market, just because that sales cycle exists doesn't mean that everyone is on the same page. They're at the same stage. Um, they're, you know, they need the same things to move forward. And so that, that asking our question, the question of what does the buyer need from us, um, not what we need from them, is really going to help us identify who those active buyers are, who those um, folks that really need us now are, so that, again, we can, we can help make more of them bubble to the top. And so, you know, we would not send the same type of information um, to a, a district that maybe is just beginning their planning of a blended learning initiative that would launch next year, as opposed to a district that's two years in and is looking to re revise their blended learning strategy or looking for new technology to fit in there. We need to personalize that message based on where they're at um, and what their, their context is. Um, same thing goes for, you know, if we're campaigning into um, the top 200 school districts or the top you know, the 200 largest, we're probably going to alter our message a little bit if we're going to be going to folk, you know, districts that are under 10,000 students. It's not the same message. They don't have the same needs. They don't have the same bandwidth or staff. Um, and so making sure that we're thinking about where that buyer is and how can we use forms, how can we use emails, different things like that to determine where they are um, and how can, how, what can we provide um, to get them to take that next step or indicate to us that they're ready to take that next step. Um, I know we're running short on time here, so I'm going to stop there and turn the mic back over to Jenny. Um, I don't know if we've got time to go through each one of these or if we want to um, kind of just wrap them all up. But, uh, Jenny, I'll leave that up to you. Okay. So in these next slides, and these will be distributed to everyone um, after the webinar is complete, we talk about each one of those bubbles as different channels um, and how they can help drive your buyer's experience at different phases. So what you'll want to do, and I think we should, I'll, I'll just do a quick summary of what's on each of those slides, and then Suzanne, we can buzz to the, the last slide that we have available. From, from a tactical perspective, you can take a look at these slides um, in the deck to think about, okay, we've got email, we have webinars, we have conferences, um, social media, direct mail, all as channels that are available to us. Um, as marketers to get the message out. At what stage are we in that buyer's journey? Which context is most important for that buyer? So where, where are we going to address each one of their needs? Can it be in multiple channels? Should it be in just certain channels? And how does that drive an ROI for us? So I think when you're going through this presentation, which hopefully you'll do to get more detail about these channels later, I think it's important to think about from a marketing perspective, what do we need to do to help drive those qualified leads using each one of these channels? And as we believe things are important as marketers, do the salespeople have an equal belief that that works? I know one of the things we have lots of conversations about, especially you know, as it's time to prepare for some of the large tech conferences in the winter, is you know, what are we getting out of these conferences? What do we get out of those conferences from a marketing perspective? What are we getting out of those conferences from a sales perspective? And are those two things even on the same page to help drive a positive ROI for those conferences? So these slides are meant to be kind of a springboard for you to think about what are we depending on from a marketing perspective? What have we done? What, do, what have we planned? And how does that align with what our salespeople are actually seeing that they need and what they're seeing is either producing or um, supporting a qualified lead coming in. So, um, Suzanne, if you want to go to that second to last slide. And, and Jenny, while we're doing that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chime in and add to that as well, that you know, all of these different tactics, they all serve a purpose. They can serve purposes for every level of the funnel, aside from maybe a few. Um, but again, I want to tie this back to the, the buyer's context and personalizing their experience. Uh, and I'm going to use my, my company as, as an example. Um, you know, we support many different members of our client family that touch on so many different neighborhoods of, uh, of education. Each one of them have their own preferences on how we want, how they want us to communicate with them. And, and it may seem simple, but it really is 
very important that we establish solid communication channels from day one with our clients. Some of them prefer using Google Apps. Some of them prefer Word. Some of them prefer a project management tool that they use. Some like to connect virtually um, in a video conference. Some like to use the phone. The same goes with educators and administrators as well. Um, that looking at where are these people getting their information and what information are they consuming there. Um, something that we put out on Pinterest or Facebook is going to be vastly different than maybe something we post on LinkedIn or something we use in an email campaign or at least the way that we package it. And so, again, looking at where do those folks get that information as well as you know, what, what types of information is being consumed there is going to be huge in informing your content strategy to help move them through that buyer's journey. Um, and so that's, you know, that's certainly one part of this last slide. Um, but ultimately, you know, looking at some of the, the go-tos as well is the buying cycles that Jenny um, had looked at. You know, we, we recently, um, you know, were in discussions about running a back-to-school campaign with a, with a client, and they were, you know, very sure that they wanted to do it. And we talked through some of the pros and cons. Um, and rather than run that the third or fourth week of August when, you know, folks like us here in Minnesota, we started school this week, um, and others maybe are in their first week of school or students aren't quite back yet, um, not the right time. People are paying attention to their PD, getting to know their kids, um, making sure that they're ready for the school year or they're in the thick of things already. Um, back to school campaigns can be run after that, that we can still play on the fact that there were some hardships, there were some challenges there, and we can provide a, an option or some content or whatever it might be. Um, so making sure that you're taking some of those some of those things into account, um, but also looking at tying your your solution or whatever to trends that are being discussed by thought leaders in the industry, and of course, the ever powerful funding sources. Um, and so I uh, I don't want to talk through this whole slide, and I know we want to leave time for for questions. Um, so Jenny and Craig want to open it up to you guys to add. From my perspective, I think we're probably ready for questions. Greg, any other words of wisdom before we let the uh, let the crowd ask some questions? Let's let the crowd crowd ask some questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing all this information. And um, yeah, due to our time constraints, we did have to skip over some um, really important and great content. So um, be on the lookout for um, a link to that tomorrow um, in your inbox. We'll be sending um, an email out that will have a link to the recording into the PowerPoint slides. You'll also be able to find those on the Agile website, which is agile-ed.com. And while you're there, you can access this webinar as well as a whole host of other webinars that we've done in the past. They're a great resource um, for your marketing and sales team. Um, and one thing before we get to questions, or one more thing, is um, I'd like to mention that both CR with Panache and Agile um, are going to be at EdNet, which is September 17th through 19th. Um, it's a great conference, and um, we're both companies are happy to be there and happy to be sponsoring it. Um, if you're going to be in Scottsdale at EdNet, uh, make sure to take some time to talk um, with this talented team. They'll be there to answer questions um, and happy to talk with your company about um, this and other marketing topics. Um, also, Jacob is going to be part of a panel discussion on Monday, September 18th at EdNet called Don't Crash the Party, Get Invited, Why a Disruptive Approach to Marketing is No Longer Relevant. That's going to be held on Monday of the conference um, at 10 in the morning. You're not going to want to miss this session. Um, PR with Panache has done some really interesting research with educators um, about how they like to be marketed to, what their preferences are. So that um, research data is going to be shared um, during that session. And Jacob and the panelists will be joined by um, the superintendent of Congress Elementary School District there in Arizona. And she's going to share her perspectives um, on communicating how she likes to be communicated with um, by education businesses. So. Um, check that out, and we'll hope to see you at EdNet. Um, and now let's go to some questions. Um, all right, so um, back to the service level um, agreement that we talked about earlier in the presentation. Um, is this something that is created by marketing and then presented to sales, or is it done in collaboration? Um, talk a little bit about how you've seen your clients create those. So that's a wonderful question. I'll take the take the first stab at that one. Um, I really see this as something that should be driven by marketing. Um, you know, we're we're really, um, you know, the ones that should be driving a lot of this. And um, if we're going to, you know, want to put ourselves in the driver's seat, taking charge of this and and being the facilitators, being the ones that kind of extend the olive branch and give sales the opportunity to share the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, is really great. Uh, and it, it's something that, you know, marketing should be looking at at somewhat of a framework. Um, you're aware of your goals. You're aware of, you know, you're, you're the ones that can be doing that research on your current customers, 
um, recently closed sales, that kind of thing. Um, and you're also the one that really is responsible for keeping that buyer's journey in, intact um, and for nurturing those folks along, um, as well as making sure that beyond handing off a marketing qualified lead, sales is supported. You know, sometimes they do still need those one sheeters. They do still need some of those resources. And so I really see this as something being driven by marketing. Um, it is, like I said before, that way to extend the olive branch um, and to bring them into the fold saying, we want your feedback. We need your feedback. Um, we can't do this without you. Uh, so that that's my take on it, and that's the approach that we take, and it's it's been very successful. So, um, Jenny and Craig, anything you want to add? No, not from my perspective. Yep, I believe you covered it from mine as well. Okay, and one other question about the um, SLA: um, Are there repercussions built into that if either side drops the ball on what's supposed to be happening? Ooh. That's a good one. I love that question. Um, the answer is really it's up to you. Um, you know, assuming that the majority of us have a higher power to report to, whether it's a client, um, it's uh, a president, a CEO, a board, whatever it may be, um, you know, those those repercussions may be imposed on you without, um, you know, you knowing it or, or without having a say in it. Um, there are certain numbers we need to hit. Um, and so the one thing that I would recommend there is is using a little bit of backwards design. Um, if you have a revenue goal of a million dollars to hit per quarter, working back to, you know, what's your average size of sale, um, how many leads do you need um, in order to get the number of sales that you need, meaning what's your closing percentage, um, going back to, you know, what, uh, how many marketing qualified leads do you need to do that, how many visitors do you need from your website to convert and to nurture, um, and so kind of going through that backwards design, you should be able to identify what those numbers look like, um, and while, you know, it seems strange that, to hit a million dollars in revenue, we actually need to start with increasing our web traffic. Um, it seems like worlds apart, but going through that backwards design, you're able to kind of identify each step of the way. What needs to happen for this to happen? What needs to happen for this to happen? And going back and then ultimately you end up with those numbers. Um, but then it is coming up with that plan of how do we increase web traffic? Is it social? Is it doing a, an SEO audit and revisiting you know, how our, our search en engine optimization is performing? Um, do we need to create more content offers? Do we need, you know, whatever that may be, identifying at those different stages what needs to happen to improve those metrics, um, and then setting those goals that are, are attainable, um, but relatively aggressive as well. All right, and since we just have a few minutes left, I'm going to um, cut the other panelist off and go, <laughs> go to another question. Um, so we uh, mentioned marketing automation and lead scoring and all of those things that kind of are made easier <laughs> by having a marketing automation system. Um, this uh, particular participant um, is using HubSpot and they're struggling with how to do prospecting. Um, you know, they're, they're following the best practices for inbound marketing in terms of their website and SEO and those types of things, but they still are needing to generate more leads. Um, do you have some suggestions on prospecting within a marketing automation platform like HubSpot? When I'm sure the other panelists want to talk on this, Jenny, you in particular, but Craig wanted to kind of serve it up to talk about um, PPC is that I know is a great channel. And then Jenny, I'm sure you've got a plethora of information to share about um, prospecting via email. Yeah, real quick, as far as PPC is concerned, I think it's great to um, pick out a few pieces of content on your site or blog posts, whether it be, you know, a checklist, an infographic, an ebook, um, whatever your most popular and sort of, um, you know, high income traffic as far as what those things are drawing in. Take those, run a couple PPC campaigns, maybe some remarketing campaigns with some ads, and see if you can generate more new traffic coming into your site. Um, that's generally what we use the PPC cam campaigns for, um, but opening this up to Jenny here because I know we're short on time. Great, thanks. So, you know, I think this is a is an ongoing and growing problem with marketing automation in terms of the information that's allowed to be used to email market, especially from an outbound perspective. So one of the challenges that many of our clients have is they've invested a significant amount of money in one of the major platforms like Apartat or Marketo, and then all of a sudden they're unable to really prospect with those systems. Um, companies like Agile, who I admittedly work for, I feel like there needs to be a kind of disclaimer put there. Um, we do have deployment services, so you, you kind of have to go outside of your normal um, marketing automation system to find deployment services to help you with that very top of the funnel email marketing campaign, um, but there definitely are services out there at your disposal. 
When, and one more thing I'd like to chime in as well, and a you know, disclaimer, we are a full service inbound agency as well as, as PR, but um, things like PR um, are another way to, to do some prospecting and get those opt-in lists. Um, you know, and, and being sure that you're directing traffic to the right places on your site. Um, don't um, leave them up to their own devices that you send them to your homepage and they're gonna find where they need to go, direct them. If you've got um, a content offer like Craig mentioned, make sure you're pointing them right to it. If you're getting an article published, whether it's an end user or you um, that's bylining that, direct them right to your landing page, direct them right to a blog post that expands on an opinion that has a conversion path there for them to convert on. So, you know, make sure that you're steering them to the right place that gives them the the easiest opportunity to raise their hand and enter your funnel. Um, and don't forget about conference lists, things like that. If people interact with you, they let you scan their badge, things like that, that is a form of opt-in, um, but there are lots of options. Um, and so, Emily, if there are more that we need to dive into as far as questions go, we can certainly provide answers via email as well. Absolutely, and we'll share those with you guys um, after this. But um, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us and for the great questions that came in. And thanks to um, Jacob, Craig, and Jenny for all of the great information that they shared. One final reminder that you will get this PowerPoint slides and the recording, so just keep an eye on your inbox for that. Also, our next webinar is coming up later in October, and then we're going to do a check-in on ESA and do a dive into um, ESA and school improvement and what educators are looking for from education companies to help them accomplish those school improvement goals. So keep an eye on your inbox and the Agile website for more information about that webinar as well. So have a great afternoon, everyone, and thanks again for joining us.